so we're going to start with a um, introduction by our uh, Tourism Burnaby Executive Director, Chris Peters. And then we'll kind of go into welcoming and introducing the panelists. So I will um, pass it off to Chris and I'm going to stop sharing the screen now. So. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, Seth. I've prepared a couple of notes here just because I didn't want to forget anything, but uh, I just want to say good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Chris Peters. I'm the Executive Director for uh, Tourism Burnaby. Um, before we get too far here, I also wanted to take a moment to recognize that Burnaby is located on the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Hunkulminam and Suquamish speaking peoples, and to extend appreciation for the opportunity to present from this shared territory. Um, I'm really excited today to welcome you to this call. Asian Heritage Month is an important time of year, especially in cities like Burnaby, where our identity as a destination is so intertwined with the diverse cultures of our citizens. This year though, the experience has been very different with people joining together online instead of in person, but it's no less important, nor should it be any less impactful. So I thank you once again for joining us on this call. Canada has seen immigrants from East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia as early as the 1800s. Early migrants journeyed to the gold rush towns like Barkerville or settled in growing cities like Victoria's Chinatown. Early migrants also experienced much racism in the early years of Canada. A ship called the Komagata Maru, full of immigrants from India, arrived at the port of Vancouver in May of 1914, but the passengers were denied entry, and in July of that same year, they were sent back to India. Chinese Canadians arrived earlier to Canada, but with the Chinese Immigration Act of 1885, the Canadian government charged a head tax for each Chinese person trying to immigrate to Canada, followed by the 1923 Immigration Act, also known as the Chinese Exclusion Act, barring Chinese from entering Canada. Chinese men and women joined the Canadian military at the start of World War II, but didn't receive Canadian citizenship until 1947. At the same time, Japanese Canadians were thrown into internment camps and stripped of their property, with many forced to move to Japan, and later others dispersed across east of the Rockies. The Japanese had already been denied voting rights in 1895 and only gained full rights by 1949. These are just some of the examples of Canada's dark past, but we should remember, while at the same time, shed some light on the success and the groundwork that was laid by early pioneers. As many Asian Canadians have risen to the occasion to become Canada's political and military leaders, doctors, lawyers, leading scientists and researchers, athletes, artists, entrepreneurs, and so on over the past 75 years. In light of recent events around British Columbia, I think we realize that there is more that can be done to celebrate Asian heritage in the province, but also to educate those that do not yet appreciate the achievements and contributions from this community. There are currently so many positive initiatives in the community and I believe it is important to highlight those, especially right now. Today, I'm honored and humbled to welcome some community leaders that continue to work towards this positive change in Burnaby, in the province and beyond. And without further ado, allow me to turn things over to Seth to make these introductions and to get us started today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That's that's uh, that's that's a great way to introduce the topic. Uh, so I, I wanted to start um, and and just with the panelists, um, you know, no particular order, uh, but we have the Honorable Anne K uh, Kang joining us. She's the BC Minister of Citizen Services, also responsible for multiculturalism. Uh, you know, very important. Uh, Professor Dr. Henry Yu, uh, Department of History at UBC, and also Principal at St. John's College. Um, Dr. Yu is also an offer and you know, uh, expert in Asian-Canadian uh, relations. Uh, Barbara Lee, who is the founder and president at the Vancouver Asian Film Festival. Uh, Alice Hu, who is an entrepreneur and executive at Asians Without Borders, uh, NAP, and also Ascend. So uh, NAP is North American a Association of Asian Professionals. So they have 10 different chapters across North America. And Ben Hum, which, who is a serial entrepreneur, and also president of the York Region uh, NAP. So I also, so, so thanks for joining us uh, uh, to, to our panelists. I also wanted to do a quick recognition of Richard Liu who helped uh, this week with some of the heritage context and bringing together some of the speakers. So 
Richard is a proud UBC Asian Studies alumni who sits on various boards in our community for heritage. And for him, it's a privilege for, uh, for him to be part of the Burnaby Heritage uh, Commission, Pacific Canada Heritage Center, and Barkerville Historic Town and Parks Board. Uh, in addition, he was appointed the Honorary Brigade Division President for Burnaby St. John's Ambulance and currently advises companies and organizations on a variety of sectors pertaining to Asia from his bunker in Burnaby during this pandemic. So we'll, we'll get started with, with the questions and there's no particular order in terms of um, for, for the panelists how uh, who answers first, but um, feel free to uh, provide an answer, but please give the other panelists a chance to uh, provide their input. So Asian Heritage Month is, is an opportunity for all of us as Canadians to learn more about the achievements and contributions of, of Canadians uh, who have Asian descent throughout history uh, and, and those who have made us the amazing country that we are today. So the theme for Asian Heritage Month 2020 is Asian Canadians United in Diversity. And this, this topic continues to be uh, inspired by you know, the rich uh, history of these Canadians and continues to make us the country that is vibrant, inclusive, and, and compassionate. Uh, so we wanna celebrate the, the diversity. And so with our special panelists, I wanna begin and, and ask um, that each panelist you know, share their past journey and how they got to their current role today. Uh, so perhaps uh, Barbara, you could get us started. Okay. Um... So I started the Vancouver Asian Film Festival almost 25 years ago. At the time, I was, um, you know, and I still work in the financial field, but I was looking at ways to express my creative, um, creative, creative arts, music, filmmaking, and I shot a short, a short film, and a friend of mine took me down to the Seattle, and there was a. Seattle International Asian American Film Festival. And I thought that would be great. You know, there must be one in Vancouver. I came back here and there wasn't one. And we thought Vancouver should be the most, you know, should be the place that there should be one. And so we got together and I was really naive. I was very young at the time in my 20s. So I, we decided to do it and um, it was a lot of work. And I don't know, knowing what I know now, if I would still do it. And basically the Vancouver Asian Film Festival happens the first weekend of every, of November. And uh, we are the longest running oldest Asian film festival of its kind in Canada. And it, there's a circuit of them, LA, New York, San Francisco. And basically our mandate is to promote increased representation of Asian Canadians, Asian Americans, so that we can be seen and heard because we feel that that's the best way to empower and educate people about our community. I want to keep it short so everyone has a turn. <laughs> yeah, so it's on mute there. Uh, yeah, who have, could uh, someone else want to want to jump in? So, talk to you maybe. Oh, pass on. Sorry. Um, first, uh, thanks for uh, you know having me, inviting me, and uh, it's it's uh, great to follow actually Barbara because I know her and uh, and she's been so active in various things. I mean, we worked together on actually the. Uh, uh, early start Mandarin um, program that went ended up going into BSD as well as Quitlam and a few other uh, schools and so there's there's all kinds of things where Barbara and I go back. Um, so who, me, um, let's see, volume wise, can you hear me? I'm just uh, maybe I'm not close enough to the microphone or something, um, or I'll just shout. I'd use my professor voice, which is. Uh, you know, reach the far back of the electoral. So I, I was born here um, in 1967. Uh, so it's, you could say I've lived through a third of Canadian history. Um, and my great grandfather came here in the 1880s. Um, you know, my grandfather and his brothers came here. Uh, my parents though, came here in 1965 as immigrants, sort of first generation. Um, and, and that's a, really the direct result, you could say, of this particular way in which Vancouver has been connected to places in southern China that sent a lot of young men to, you know, spend their lives here, helping build BC, helping build not just the CTR railroad and, and uh, but bridges, infrastructure. They, you know, they grew the food that fed Vancouver and Victoria and, you know, most places 
Um, so this long history of, of Chinese uh, here, uh, Japanese, Canadian, people from India, but that uh, what Chris referred to as a long history also of exclusion, of segregation, of, of legalized racism and discrimination. In other words, up until the 1960s, it was perfectly legal to say you couldn't live here because you're Asian or there because, or to not hire someone just because they were Chinese or Japanese or non-white. It was legal. You know, anti-discrimination, you know, laws in terms of housing and, and, uh, and jobs didn't, didn't get implemented until 1960s. And that was in order to reverse what had been the full power of the state, whether a municipal level, provincial or federal, excluding, segregating, harassing, you know. Um, and that's why there were these provincial apology in 19, or in 2014. That's why the city of Vancouver had a formal apology for its long history of anti-Chinese and uh, exclusion in 2018. It's why there was a federal policy in 2006. These weren't empty apologies. These were for real things. And um, so that's my story is as a historian, I was gonna be a lawyer. I was on the way to be a lawyer when I was a UBC student. And then I hated history, hated memorizing dates, hated all this stuff that it seemed to me had nothing to do with me. But I'd say, you know, in terms of Asian Heritage Month and how I got involved with when I began to see that actually history had shaped me and my life and that of my family. And that who I was and how I had grown up here uh, in BC, everything had been shaped by history. And, and that was a way of saying history isn't what I'm reading in books. History is the stories of my grandparents and my mother and my relatives. And, and you know, why is it that our, our, my dad was a mining engineer, but then we ran a grocery store? Why did all my relatives run grocery stores and small businesses? And so that's my way of saying who I am and how I got here and why it's tied in some sense to my profession as a historian, uh, a researcher, a teacher, uh, you know, and, and why I, I suppose I'm on this panel and why also at this time with a lot of anti-Asian you know, racism with COVID-19 that that's not a surprise either, that in some sense we shouldn't be surprised that this is happening. So I'll leave it at that. Fantastic. Uh, so Alice, uh, when I get to you, Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, so I, I came to Canada in 91 with my parents and um, so they were first generation immigrants and sort of seeing their progression coming, you know, we essentially had nothing when we came here and um, going to, uh, to start their own business and uh, sort of progress to a series of businesses um, and eventually um, working on business ventures with my family. I. I feel like throughout the whole journey of, of my corporate career, um, I, I definitely feel like there there was, you know, I've encountered uh, challenges based on my ethnicity and uh, also gender. So I really felt like it was important to do the work. And, and so I am part of um, NAP and uh, Asians Without Borders and Ascend. Uh, we have similar messaging uh, just in that we all try to promote Pan-Asian leaders and um, we, we go about it in different ways. So there, there are some groups that focus more on events. There are uh, some groups that focus more on training. So working on communication skills, uh, interpersonal skills, and um, just developing that skill set to, to help you break through the management level. Um, I know culturally, as Asians, we, we are more um, likely to be on the conservative side or, or not speak up and, you know, and um, sort of get the recognition that we actually deserve and, and feel like we actually deserve a spot at the table. So I, I really feel like um, it's important to do the work. I, I did spend... Uh, uh, a number of years in uh, diversity and inclusion uh, 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 consulting as, as well. So sort of working with uh, the corporate real estate sector to showcase that we can prove that this actually does make a difference to your bottom line. 
um, and also it's good for culture and also you're making a difference and sort of challenging the way um, the overall community thinks uh, about um, the Asian community. Yeah, that's, that, that's a fantastic um, intro. Uh, ben, um, yeah. Okay, um, thank you for the opportunity to share this evening with you. Um, I was born in Canada, but my first generation, my family that immigrated to Canada was my great grandfather. So many of the things that Chris and Henry was mentioning really resonates with me because my great grandfather was the part of the wave that helped build the cross country um, Canadian Pacific Rail. And then my grandfather who, set, who settled in Montreal paid the $500 Chinese head tax um, under the act. And I still have that certificate back in Montreal. And so I was planning to go back and scan it just for my own archives and for uh, my future generations just to appreciate what Asian Heritage Month is all about. But despite all the challenges we're facing now, I'm actually grateful every day to be standing on the shoulders of giants. So Asian Heritage Month has a really deep meaning for me personally. Uh, I'm originally from Montreal actually, but I grew up in Drummondville, which is actually a small town in between um, Quebec City and Montreal. And at that time, we were only about 10 Chinese families in the town. Um, you would think that growing up in a Francophone town that uh, I was facing discrimination. But the interesting thing was that my parents were restaurant entrepreneurs. And uh, we were only one of two Chinese restaurants in the town. And what I found out at a very young age was that great ethnic food was a, is, is, is a fantastic bridge to build, people, to build bridges in between people and cultures. So we use a lot of egg rolls, chicken fried rice, and almond cookies to build those bridges. And, and so, um, and actually working for my parents at a very young age of eight years old by washing dishes and washing the floors, I, I gained a really strong work ethic and that stayed with me even till now. So hence, um, I love being an entrepreneur. Um, I, I think those genes were handed down by my parents. <laughs> And as an entrepreneur, we just love to launch things. So in 2000, I co-founded the Toronto chapter of the North American Association of Asian Professionals, and uh, where we focus on leadership uh, development, career advancement, um, diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And at that time, when, when, when I founded the chapter here, uh, we were only 12 chapters. And today, we're actually in 30 cities in uh, US and Canada. And one of the proud programs that we have is um, our ERG Leadership Council, where we work with Asian uh, employee resource groups to actually share, to share best practices across different companies to um, create opportunities for advancement. And then in 2010, I co-founded the Waterfront Night Market in partnership with TNT Supermarket. And that actually is still in operation uh, today, where it's hosted at Ontario Place where we feature over 120 different food vendors and welcome over 100,000 visitors over three nights. So this year, 2020, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary by not having an event. So it's gonna be an interesting year. We hope to have an opportunity to host it again in 2021 and have a comeback bigger and, and even better. But I am extremely proud of our heritage, but also thankful for having the opportunity to have the best of both worlds, of being Asian and being Canadian. That's fantastic. Um, and, um, you, know, you know, last but not least, uh, you know, Minister Kang, Kang if you wanted to, uh, yeah, share, share your uh, journey. Thank you so much. And it is such a great honor to be among all these wonderful panelists. Um, some of them um, I have met before. And just to hear your stories and to really share, uh, you know, in our stories of Asian heritage, uh, especially on this month. And we, we know that, unfortunately, there has been a long history in BC of racism against uh, people of Asian heritage. And a big part of my job recently has been to really denounce uh, racism especially towards uh, people of Asian heritage or people who look like they're from Asian heritage. And I had a good friend who is First Nation and she was attacked uh, because she sneezed and someone um, you know, made that effort to cross the street and go punch her in the face. So um, just because she, she looked quite Asian. So that it's, 
regardless of who you are and um, you know people should not be treating people with violence and uh, with hate and racism but a little bit of my history of how I came into politics uh, it has never been my intention ever of pursuing politics um, but uh, in a way I think politics uh, pursued me by accident as well so my dream uh, I'll, I'll start with my family history so my grandfather brought my younger aunt, uh, who is the sister, younger sister of my mom, to Canada uh, in Vancouver in uh, the mid-1970s. And then shortly after the 1980s, uh, we immigrated to Canada, my whole family. And my lifelong dream, because of that cultural shock, uh, I came when I was grade one, and everybody knew English because early on during that time, not a lot of people uh, spoke a second language. So most of my friends who are from Hong Kong or from India, they, they all spoke English. They were all um, either um, second or third generations. And I was the only person who was considered at the time ESL, which now we're, we're calling ELL. And, um, but it was, it was because of the kindness and the inclusion that my grade one teacher showed me that I felt, you know what, someday I want to make my students feel this way as well, to be included, to feel loved. So my lifelong dream was to be a teacher. Uh, my, my father uh, is a minister, so I grew up in a church environment where I had lots of opportunities to uh, contribute back to the community and to volunteer. And so through volunteerism, I found um, interest in cultural festivities and volunteering in bigger events. And eventually that just um, led to people in politics uh, recognizing that I was actually quite active. And so, so they said, well, do you want to volunteer with us politically? And so that's, that's how I began, is to slowly first get to know my community, then slowly get to know politics. When I was first elected in 2008, um, in the history of Burnaby, there has never been um, a Chinese uh, descent uh, elected official. The, the time before me, we had our first um, Southeast Asian um, city council elected, so South Daliwa was our first. And the time after that, in 2008, my colleague Richard Chang and myself were the first Chinese descent to be elected in um, the city of Burnaby. So that's something we always celebrate, is bringing in diversity. And um, another aspect of that is really bringing diversity in terms of gender equity, uh, because as we see right now in Burnaby Council, we have one woman, one woman, um, and uh, the, the rest of uh, Burnaby Council are men. Um, but they're wonderful men, so. <laughs> but I, I would love to see more uh, uh, diversity and gender equity, of course, in uh, all politics. So um, that's, that's how I got into politics, is, is really through volunteerism and my passion to want to give back to the community. Um, but I do want to uh, really say that throughout our history, there have been many inspirational individuals in our Asian heritage uh, whose accomplishments have played a vital role in BC's social and economic uh, success. Some of these names that you might already have heard before, so David Lamb. David Lamb was uh, our 25th Lieutenant Governor in British Columbia. And um, we have Asa Johal, He's a Sikh immigrant who founded Terminal Force Products. Some of you might have heard of him. Um, it's BC's largest independent lumber company. And Masumi Mitsui is a Canadian soldier, a decorate, decorated with a military medal for bravery during the battle at Vimy Ridge. And following his return to BC, Mitsumi also helped establish a Japanese Kenyan War Memorial in Stanley Park. So, so many things we could celebrate today, but also, um, Richard did bring to my attention, so I want to make sure that I, I deliver his condolences as well to the families of Bab Babur uh, Singh Senior. And he was um, a Burnaby resident from India with three Olympic gold medals in the, in the field of field hockey. So I want here to have everyone join me in um, giving our deepest condolences to the families and friends of Babur. Um, you know, I, when, when I read about him, I, I felt uh, great regret that I didn't have the chance to meet him. And the reason why I'm bringing up this because, uh, well, one, because my good friend Richard asked me to, but also um, Bobira has contributed so much to a collective journey. And, um, you know, I, I don't want his story to die with his passing. And I'm hoping that everybody will celebrate his life the way um, our, all of our collective community would. So thank you so much. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Thanks, uh, uh, Anne, for sharing. 
Um, yeah, and th thanks all for all our panelists for sharing their rich heritage and, and your journeys of, of how you, um, you came to be who you are today. Um, and, you know, you really all are inspirations for us all and, you know, really true examples of um, where diversity is, is our strength. Uh, so as we look, moving into the next question, as we look at our current global pandemic, um, you know, we're noticing a rise in racial incidents uh, towards Asian, um, Asian people. and uh, you know, the question, this is kind of hits at heart for me because, you know, I, I um, similar to, uh, you know, what Alice is, uh, and Ben's story, you know, I, I grew up in a small town in Australia and as a four-year-old, I remember lining up for the school bus and, and I faced that from a very early age. So um, the question I would say, and, uh, you know, what is your advice and how we can respond in a more positive and community driven format? And can you share some examples? Uh, so, Perhaps we can have uh, Ben start start first. Just on mute there, Ben. Uh, the question is what type of positive actions that we could take? Yeah, and, and more community driven, um, uh, you know, examples. Okay. Um, well, I can share what NAP is doing uh, between all our chapters. We have a number of campaigns. I was speaking to Barbara earlier as well, and that it's wonderful to see how different organizations are implementing and deploying different programs to address um, Asian um, directed uh, stereotyping and violence. And the, the fight I would say is, is quite broad because there's so many people to reach. And, and so by working together and coordinating our efforts, we'll make a much more um, solidified action and with NAP, we, we launched an I, I Am Not a Virus campaign um, for Asian Heritage Month. And what we have is a, is a profile um, photo frame that people can choose to add to their Facebook profile just so they can have a voice and to unify with the message of just because I am Asian, I am not a virus. Uh, we also have a complimentary campaign called I Am an Ally to embrace uh, champions in our community that are not Asian who wants to support us as well. Uh, they have friends, they have neighbors, they have spouses that are Asian and they wanna stand with us. So it's impor very important to reach out to, to non-Asians who want to be our ally and as well as the violence that we see in terms of being Asians, it's very similar to African-Americans and African, uh, African Canadians as well. So if we can understand what they're going through, they'll understand what we're going through in order to uh, better support each other. So there are a couple of articles that I can certainly share to the groups that some action oriented items that we can all take. And it's really very grassroots. It starts with every one of us uh, taking the very little action that really adds up. Uh, we actually launched a global campaign to reach out to the Asian diaspora around the world and we have a healthcare, a healthcare professional video that we edited and put uh, together and published. Um, I'll, I'll share the link with everyone who would like to see it. But it's also to advocate for our frontline healthcare workers who actually are being attacked just because the fact that they are Asian. So we need to stand up for them as well. Fantastic. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Yu, may I, perhaps you could um, provide your context here. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, I, I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I, I know that a lot of people have been galvanized over the last, you know, few weeks and, and month. Uh, it, to me, you know, again, because I study this, uh, I, I, I always look for uh, not waiting until the moment someone gets hit, you know, before you, you, you know, I know that this has been very public and, and, uh, and we've charted the rise of hate crimes, the VPD. But the, the hate crime statistic is a very good example. Um, we can only know that there's been a rise in hate crimes because we've been keeping stats. And it's not because the Vancouver Public, our Vancouver Police Department just decided one day to keep hate crime statistics. It was, it was something they ha were forced to do because of some incident way before. And so I think that's one of the things I'd say as we, as we organize, as people get upset, as they get galvanized is, um, A, learn about, 
the history of it. Why is it that this is not just popping out and it's like uh, a surprise? As I said, you know, I'm not surprised, but that's because, you know, you understand the history of it. The second is uh, exactly what I think Ben and others, that it's not a mistake when Dakota Holmes is, you know, mistaken for Asian and hit. That's racism works on that. You know, I blame all of you people. I can hit any of you because you're all at fault. It's not a mistake when the wrong Asian, well, she's not even Chinese, she's Japanese. That's how ignorant racists are. That's not ignorance or a mistake. This is what racism is. Um, so uh, I think, again, is to kind of inform yourself uh, and also to understand the feelings that a lot of people are having right now that maybe you were like the captain of the volleyball team and you were valedictorian of a high school class and you achieved and you, you were at the top of your profession, you were given prizes and you're going, oh my God, and someone could just randomly hit me just because of the way I look. And, and it's, it's become debilitating. I've heard lots of people talk about how shocked they've never encountered racism. Actually, you have. It's just that you weren't aware or you were able to ignore it or you were able to kind of just overcome it and say, it's okay, I, it's not me. It doesn't happen to me because I'm successful. Uh, this kind of idea that you can be a model minority is the term that is often used in the United States, that if you're a model minority, you'll be exempt. That's one of the things that is actually quite debilitating for a lot of people right now who are, it's become a part of the Asian Canadian experience is to feel shock and a kind of, it's become personal at this moment. And to not lose that sense and to say, actually, it's important to think about others who, a lot of Indigenous peoples who face this on a daily basis. I was really actually moved by Dakota Holmes sort of making the statements like, you know, I'm glad it happened to me because I'm used to this. It happens to me all the time, you know, and I can handle it. And that was a way of saying the kind of resilience that a lot of people who actually maybe face it uh, and understand what's going on and are able to be resilient. And that may be a lesson for a lot of others. If you're feeling like shocked and overcome and, and, and questioning everything because of what you see in the news, um, you're, you're in some sense are understanding now what it is to be Asian in Canada or in Vancouver or in BC. Um, and if it's for the first time, realize that there's a broader context, there's other groups that organizing, responding, taking some agency in your own life is one of the ways that you can feel better and less helpless, less of a victim. And there's a long history. What make, and I'll just stop on this point, what makes us so unique? Why we are thinking that Vancouver Chinatown should be a world UNESCO heritage site. It's not because of the food or other things. It's because it's a symbol of people struggling against racism, helping change things so that we have a more fair society. That's what makes us unique, is not that we have racism. That's actually not very unique. It's that who struggled together, who pushed back against it, who changed things for the better. And that's why I'm also really heartened to see many of our political leaders uh, really, you know, like with Minister Kang, you know, stand up and, and say, this is not us. It is us but it's not us now. And I think that is the key. It's like the hate crime statistics. You have to be aware of that history and the vigilance that's required all the time to make sure that we understand the context of this and to speak out against it. Yeah, that's, that's, very, that's very insightful, uh, uh, Dr. Yu. Uh, looks uh, like Barbara, it looks like you wanted to, to potentially jump in there. Or? No, it's always hard to follow Henry because he's so well spoken and so knowledgeable about all of this. So um, I would say that it's so the Vancouver Asian Film Festival launched Eliminate Hate with elimin with eight hate dot org and because one of the things that we've always talked about, not so um, overtly, is that racism has been around for a long time and a lot of it, Asian communities, when we have our festival, they say to us, oh, but it doesn't happen to us. We are, you know, I've never experienced. And as what Henry said, you have experienced. You may not have, and may not have registered or it's been sort of covert that it just may seem like a joke or just an offhand kind of comment, but it's there. 
And I saw a lot of it coming out, you know, when there were these reports of the real estate issue, um, you know, what was happening in Vancouver, probably Toronto with, with the immigrant. And even Asian Canadians were saying, well, that's them, not us. Well, it's all of us when it comes time to like now, and we're not distinguished by anybody else, and they'll just have violence against whoever that looks like us. So we have to be really careful about that. And then the whole, um, the whole um, laundry, uh, what do you call it? The, um, my brain, you know, the whole- Money laundering. Money <laughs> laundering, that's right. The whole money laundering issue. And, and a lot of the blame, there's a lot of blame against the Asian community. You know, they're, they're the reasons why there's not affordable housing. Well, we're not the reason why. I mean, we're part of the reason, but the blame can be spread everywhere where but we're being targeted as it and part of what we believe is that we don't as a community have media power we don't know how to speak up for ourselves and and make the narrative coming from our community and we're allowing other people to create the the stories that really are quite damaging to our community. And I talk to a lot of businesses and business leaders and they, and I tell them, we may, parts of our community may have the wealth and the economic power, but you strip it down where money doesn't mean anything in a pandemic and look what happens. So we really need to understand the power of representation and the power of what it means to have our voices heard and being seen like everybody else as being part of the community and that we are not the other we're not the foreigners in our own country because that is a narrative that's always being shown in media and film and television and i do a lot of work about that and you know it shouldn't take this terrible situation for people to start being active like it should be something that we should always be thinking about and always saying how can we not act in silos but work together as a community and unite and how do we help each other? And that's why we're reaching out, I think to Ben and to Alice, to some of the activities they're doing and seeing how we can find cross-pollination, how we can work together, because we shouldn't be just doing this as one-offs. It should be an ongoing discussion, ongoing solidarity that we move forward with. So hashtag eliminate hate, <laughs> I'll put it in the chat. Um, I, I actually wanted to jump in. Uh, thank you, Ben and uh, Barbara. And um, I, I love how these campaigns are coming together and sort of pushing that messaging is, is really important. But I, I have a personal story. And um, just with the atmosphere of everything that's going on in the US, I feel like there's a set a heightened sense of, of racism and, and hate being spread around. And, um, you know, I, I actually was, um, subject to, to, to one of these instances where, uh, you know, an ethnic minority actually came within five centimeters of my face when then, you know, throughout the whole COVID incident and uh, was talking about the Chinese virus and uh, about wanting to bash my face and just because of the way I looked. And um, I, I feel like there's a lot of education that needs to go out and that's why we do the work. It, it's, a, it's a constant thing to sort of push out the messaging and sort of fight the good fight and, and just to prevent these things from happening. And for every hate crime that is reported and that is in the news, there's, I, I'm sure there's a few that is not reported. And um, some people just feel like they, they can live with it. And, and, you know, some people actually wanna talk about it and, and sort of trying to change the perspective yeah, thanks for sharing that, Alice. Uh, it's great, uh, Minister Kang. I wanted to uh, you know give you an opportunity to to, to um, respond. And we did have a question uh, in in the in the Zoom chat. I'll give Ben an opportunity to kind of respond to that after uh, Minister Kang. Um, yeah, it is so wonderful to hear so many passionate people around share their experience from different perspectives of um, hate and racism. Uh, what the province is doing right now is we are doubling our um, funding to combating hate and racism. So from last year to this year, we have doubled our funding. And so uh, I, I know I've talked to Barbara before as well. We have uh, our new program is called Resilience VC. And what I have heard from every one of the panel speakers today is, is really uh, hearing our resilience because our, our ancestors, our forefathers, regardless of uh, which Asian country you're from, we have all experienced um, 
racism, segregation, uh, mistreatment, um, whatnot. And we are so resilient. We continue to be um, patriotic to our country. We continue to love British Columbia. We continue to love our community and we continue to want to raise our children here. So I wanna say, you know, hands up to, to our community for being so resilient. And also here's really standing up to say, it is not okay to be racist. It is not okay to discriminate or to prejudge anyone. Um, my, my experience um, when I have been talking and, and I have been talking about racism uh, very, very broadly online or in the radio on, on my social media. And as a result of that, I, I, have, I have many people writing to me and, and, and texting me over Facebook to say, you know, take your kind and go back home. Uh, you know, why don't you talk about what Chinese people have done to us and uh, you bat eaters or uh, so, so all, all these comments, they're, they're very mean. I'm not going to repeat them. I'm, I'm sure many of you have read them somewhere. And, but what is my kind, right? If you want to talk about my kind, I am a nice person. I love my country, I love my neighbors, do unto others what you do unto me. So my kind, we're gonna be staying here. So I wanna say thank you so much to everyone. Um, people have also asked me, well, you know, it's great that the government is uh, doubling your funding to British Columbia to fight hate and racism, but it's not working. And, and so my, my comment is, it's, it's not about what the government is doing, it's what the government is saying. But most of all, it's what all of us are doing because government alone is not going to solve racism. We, we cannot change every single person, but collectively, just like we are doing today, collectively, when we talk about it, when we heal each other, when we stand in unity, when we condemn together, that will solve our problem. We need to talk about it. We can't be shy. Um, I, you know, so I, uh, the premier and myself and uh, Minister George Chow has, has talked uh, in length uh, yesterday to community leaders. One of the reasons that Asians remain silent is because we were taught that if you stay quiet, people won't pick on you. Or if you stay quiet when people pick on you, they won't kill you. And, and so that's one of the reasons why Asians continue to be quite submissive and stepping back. But we, we must not do that. So uh, when um, Dr. Yu mentioned about statistics, well, let's let's report every single crime small medium or big we need to report all of them so that they are recorded that then people um like alice and barbara and ben with, with groups that are uh working to combat racism that government also hears these so that we can actually action them if we don't hear them and there's no reaction from from or there's no um reports from police there's no reaction from the community well what what are we going to be fighting right and, and how, how, how do we justify finding funds and programs to make sure that it's, it's here to represent people? So um, if I have a takeaway message, it's to make sure that if you hear any crime, if you see any crime, make sure that you report it. You may think that when you call 911 or when you tell someone it's not going anywhere, it went somewhere. It went somewhere because today we're talking about it. Today, government is uh, putting more funding, is doubling funding, that even um, our federal government is talking about it. Municipally, we're talking about it. We, we need to make sure that this is an expectation, that there's zero tolerance in BC, in, in Canada, across the world. And, and so let le let's, uh, you know, BC be a leader. We're a leader in so many ways, and I want to continue to show that uh, in, in our love and unity. And to remind people, you might have fear against COVID-19, but you need to address the fear in a logical and sensible way and not um, with racism and hate. Thank you. I just, sorry, Seth, I just wanted to add one thing that the Eliminate Hate with partnership with um, Project 1907 collected 128 reports of anti-Asian racist attacks. And I sh you can share it out with the participants later. but. A scary statistic was 70% of those attacks were happening to Asian women, women of that were of Asian descent. So that's a pretty scary um, thought. And it really has, it goes to some mental health issues too, and the feeling of not being safe in our own community. So please go to our site and report, just like what Minister Kang said, we need to speak up.
And that's, you know, and, and that, that's really powerful to, to hear that um, from, from, uh, from, you know, uh, Minister Kang and uh, Barbara, thanks for you know, jumping in. Um, I, I know just to be respectful of uh, Minister Kang, I know you have to uh, leave at five o'clock. Um, and this is a request from uh, Richard, our, our friend Richard. Um, could, we, could we all, could the panelists uh, do a group ch uh, shot just so we can all wave and then we'll move on to question three. I know this is kind of, um, but I mean, you know, I can't, I can't turn down Richard, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there you go. So, so you can count to three. Wait a second, and uh, if we can capture that, and Connie, can you capture that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, so uh, last question, and then we have a we have a, a Q and A that or two Q and As. Um, so this is kind of the last week of Asian Heritage Month, and um, as we look forward, um, you, you know, w the question that you know we have is where do you foresee the future of preserving our heritage? And, uh, you know, how can each of us who are watching this webinar uh, be part of that collective voice? And I think some of you have already answered that question through all the different initiatives that you're part of and, and all the things that the BC, uh, you know, our, our provincial government is doing. Um, um, and so, you know, I, I think the question then is, um, are, are, there, are there ways that, um, you know, you see as kind of being the first, the most important in terms of um, keeping keeping this diversity and keeping ma making sure that we are you know vibrant and as and, you know and as Dr. Dr. Yu said it, it is it is present it's just um, maybe you we haven't experienced it before right so um, you know is, is there what is the future look like for for kind of making sure that we pass it on to the next generation so I mean you know the high schoolers or the, the folks that are in, in elementary school is something I think of so um, and feel free, anyone, you know, there's no order here, so anyone can jump in. Um, everyone's, I'm sure each one of you can provide a really good answer for this, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, interested in seeing how, yeah. I would say we need to, to make sure the education piece is there, to know the history of Asian Canadians in Canada. So that's really important. I think to support the artists, because that lives long after any business, the art, the literature, music, things that will last um, and support our own community and not be so within our silos. I think that's very important. I'll just add um, something quickly because I have to jump off to the multicultural awards uh, that's happening in half an hour. Um, but what government will do is we will strive to uh, find funding to make sure that we support legacy projects and uh, the bamboo shoot project the chinese uh, museum project uh, we are looking also at the Ch japanese uh, canadian museum project as well um, and and we are doing um, uh, an indo-canadian project uh, currently as we're talking so there's so many projects we can do to preserve history and how they will look like is to make sure that we accurately uh, record the history of those who have contributed to BC, building BC and Canada, but as well as through storytelling. So we have so many elders in our community. Take this opportunity right now, all of us, it is to listen and record what our elders are saying to us of their journey before even we came here and make sure that this history and the story narrative is passed through. So this is one of our uh, province's commitments to, to support legacy projects. And with that, I'm just going to say goodbye. Um, but thank you so much for having me today. Thanks. Uh, thank, thank you, Minister. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, we're going to address one of the questions. I, I hope uh, does, does anyone else want to provide um, any follow up before we move into the Q and A? Um, there is one program that uh, Ascend Canada is running. So we've introduced uh, local chapters into all the universities. So for example, U of T, U of Waterloo, um, UBC uh, has uh, Ascend chapters. And so we're, we're sort of trying to start them at um, a, a younger age so, so that we can work on some of the skill sets at, so that they're, they're prepared for their career transition. And maybe I'll just really quickly, just to echo something that Minister Kang said, um, you get caught up in anti-racism sometimes in this reactive, you know, you, the, what's being done to you. And, and I think it's very important in some sense to, to kind of uh, listen to one of the things that Mr. Kang brought up, which is if you don't know the story of, you know, your grandparents or how you got here or your, you know, your communities, if you don't know your history, then, then actually that's a problem for how you respond to racism. 
because then in some sense you you are only defined by how others see you um, and you, you in some sense are not pushing back against that victimization and targeting of you as what they think you are um, so that sense of really understanding who you are and creating a sense of confidence as well um, and a, a kind of getting away from a sense of insecurity that you know you are just the way you look um, that in fact there's a rich vibrant sense of yourself that's tied to your own family story how you got here what they overcame um, so it's interesting I was uh, just this morning uh, some of my students uh, one of them said oh there's this uh, Facebook page subtle Asian traits and and you think oh it's a, some, it's a, but it's you know, millions of people in this and and what you're seeing is postings of stories and uh, the PCHCMOM the Pacific Canada Heritage uh, center, uh, their, you know, migration stories are going to try to get people to, to encourage them to tell their migration story of how they or their families got here. Uh, the, the Chinese Canadian Museum that uh, Mr. Kang mentioned, you know, that story gathering, story sharing, um, storytelling, uh, you know, Vancouver Chinatown Foundation has a, a storytelling center that they'll open up hopefully soon. That I, I think that's part of how it, then it doesn't be, just become what's done to you, but what you and your the your the people before you did what they were doing and i think that is again this asian heritage month um if, if our heritage of who we are is defined by exclusion only by what was done to us by our victimization so to speak even in the present moment then you know i still see so much of that that this this story is about anti-asian racism well it's, it's also a story of who we are in bc that we are a part of this story as, as, as people who helped uh, create the, the society that we are in. Thanks, Dr. Yu, for, for that. I just want to be wary of time. I, I know that you know, we, we do sometimes go over, but I, I wanted to make sure that we, uh, we do cover one of the questions. Hopefully the panelists are okay to stick with for another five, 10 minutes here. Um, so one of the questions that we do, I'm just going to look at the Q&A here. Um, so from Kevin Chang, uh, so one of my concerns within the Asian community is not just racism. Uh, so I'm not sure if this is the right word in the same ethnicity, but I had dominant culture, but even more among Asian groups that seem to be driven by nationalistic sentiments. I wonder what the panelists' thoughts are around this issue. Examples that come to mind are issues around Taiwan, Hong Kong, China, Korea, and, uh, and Japanese relations spilling over to the immigrant community in Vancouver and other cities across North America. Um, so, yeah, that's, that, was a, that was a long, long question. Um, th does anyone want to take a, take a shot at uh, maybe uh, uh, approaching that question? Or? I, I'm fine to, to ram my, my, uh, my nose into this one. I, I, I've been asked this, it's like, well, you know, aren't there these disagreements within you know, Asian communities or Chinese, you know, Chinese can't agree or they're at each other's throats and they're hating on each other. So as if somehow this justifies, you know, anti-Chinese racism too. It's like, you see the China, again, we're in, a, we're in the wrong debate when we're trying to justify and say, no, we're innocent and all Chinese are good, or we don't, we aren't this or we aren't that. I, again, getting wrapped up into a thing where, look, people are people, humans are flawed. There are debates. I think it's actually really important and healthy to talk about important issues like, what's going on in Hong Kong or Taiwan or, or what's going on in terms of the governance of, of China. And, you know, there is nothing unhealthy in a democratic society about discussing things as long as we don't start to be violent with each other and hating on each other and, and doing the very things that we don't want done to us. Uh, and so, uh, again, you know, I, again, maybe that's just a naivete of a university professor where in a classroom we, we have to be able to think about, talk about, um, but dinner table, there, you can have a rule, like, you know, no screaming at each other and throwing food or hitting each other at the dinner table, but let's talk about issues and how you, uh, I, I think for me, uh, the uh, dialogue and conversation is important. Um, and avoiding demonization, dehumanization, and, uh, and a kind of lumping everybody together. Uh, that's separate, you could say, from the history of white supremacy and the demonization of non-whites. But the way we treat each other as 
Taiwanese and Hong Kong Chinese and whatever, you know, Korean. Um, that I think is something that also is in our control. And, and, uh, and in some sense, I don't, I don't think is as big a problem, so to speak, uh, for our society here um, as in other places. That's one of the wonderful thing about BC. We, we, you know, this is not a place where we are shooting each other, fortunately, over, you know, nationalist claims or uh, divisions over who we are and uh, who we claim to be. I would just say um, to add to that is that difference of political views and how countries are governed, that's something that ebbs and flows. We can't change our race or ethnicity. And that's something that, you know, being attacked on that is one thing, but having thoughtful discourse on different views and people can go from one, you know, be more liberal when they're younger, be more conservative when they're older, but that's something that can change and it's an ability, but we cannot change our ethnicity, our race. So that, you know, I think there's a real distinct difference there. Um, ben, ben and Alice, did, did, did you two want to want to provide some input on this? That's a very broad um, geopolitical sensitive uh, issues that uh, I think we all have our opinion. <laughs> and yeah, and it's, I mean, it's very fluid right now. It's really hard to answer this question. <laughs> sure. Well, we'll actually, we'll go to the next question from uh, Jose uh, Chang. It looks, you know, she has a great question here. Um, and I think we can wrap up with this question. So we, we have heard political leaders and police officials speak out against racism over the last few weeks. Uh, what can local businesses and brands do effectively to show solidarity and voice their support for the Asian community at this time? Actually, yeah, great, great question. I think it covers quite a, you know, quite a um, broad uh, sector approach. Um, I have something to say, but it's maybe not that popular, but um, <laughs> as a film festival, we every year go out to get corporate sponsors. You know, we talk to businesses, we say support our community, and we often get the pushback as, well, what do we, you know, like we support the cause, but we're seen as a bank account. We're seen as like customers. And I, and I get it because that's what business is about. But we don't seem to get that overall sort of support the community, support the cause type of support that I think we should. Because I think we as, as community is more than just a bank account or a dollar, what they can get out of us as business. For business. I think to make a better community, to make it us or be feel part of the community, it's not just the dollar signs. And that's something I think businesses should be very aware of. Uh, ben and Alice, uh, you know, uh, perhaps you two have an input uh, inside on that because, you know, you are from uh, like, you know, the, uh, you know, the corporate sector. I wonder if that's something that uh, you have a view of what Barbara's, uh, uh, you know, comments there. Sure. I mean, in this case, I, uh, we worked, uh, or many of the companies that come through our organizations, uh, especially with Kretsu Form, where there's a lot of startup companies, and they're looking for ways to have social capital uh, within their brand. And, and they're looking for ways to just not blindly push up, uh, push back against racism, but also how do they uh, properly embrace a message that is basically effective for their brand. Uh, if you take an um, example of Nike, uh, they stand up for, for, e for, uh, for equality based on um, sports as a way to unite different people and different, um, at, uh, di uh, like different people with ethnic backgrounds. And, and so that's an important thing in terms of how do you create that messaging that's properly aligned with your brand. Um, so really it's not just a case of, okay, well, I'm going to take my brand and just push back against racism because there's going to be other questions that come up from that uh, if it's not done properly. Um, I have some input from some of our corporate partners in a lot of the nonprofit work that we do. Um, and so these are brands that are actively trying to um, hire for inclusion and um, they're, actively trying to change things within their own ranks so that they, they can push out the messaging that 
you know, we, we should support um, people of all races and, um, and they're huge supporters of the Asian community and promoting Asian leaders. Um, you know, at the top of my head, there's, there's a few big banks and a few big consulting companies and, and law firms that are behind this. And um, I, I feel like that really does give them um, a, a certain branding. Um, so that, it's something that they can definitely say that would affect their bottom line. Okay. Uh, Doctor, did you want to? Oh, okay. I, I, I think uh, just to kind of um, reiterate, I think what uh, both uh, Ben and Allison and, and Barbara raised is that we, we often think of branding as a kind of empty, you know, exercise, but actually it's based on values and, and companies that, that have a strong corporate culture or set of values that, you know, we stand for X uh, and, you know, a diverse society. We believe that, you know, our company will thrive within a diverse society. And how does that value get both implemented internally in hiring practices, promotion, um, mentoring, all these kinds of things, which are HR, human resources issues, but also messaging and branding in the sense that Ben has said, how do, how do you go out and actually you know, tell everyone else that, yeah, you may be buying, I don't know, window shades, and you think, what does that have to do with, and yet this company and the values it stands for, the, the people who produce these window shades, we are part of this society and we believe in these certain values. And that has actually dollar value uh, in the sense of being able to uh, position yourself as a company that cares about the community. And that you, we've seen lots of examples of how people aren't just looking for the lowest price. They want to buy something that makes them feel good, right? So there is a way in which um, branding and messaging and marketing in which those feelings of this company is a strong, you know, uh, citizen, corporate citizen within the society I live in and buying this product is going to give something back to this society that I live in. That's not a losing formula for selling stuff. And so uh, I'd, I'd say that in some sense, uh, having too impoverished an idea of marketing and branding is, is perhaps one of the problems of how we, think of marketing and branding as, as very, you know, instrumental and just selling one more widget or one more, you know, object. Whereas in some sense, branding is not that. It's a storytelling about values and where the company is positioned often within a, a, you know, a broader society. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Uh, um, so I, you know, uh, I think we're, we're going to, um, you know, it's really a short time. I feel like we could have done maybe a mini conference on this for, for three hours. Um, but I wanted to just, uh, you know, wrap it up. Um, I, one thing that uh, Leticia, who is um, the executive director of Exploration, um, she wanted me to share that um, Exploration is going to be doing the Exploration 2020 Recognition Awards uh, for the Pan-Asian communities via webinar on June 19th at 8 p.m. Uh, so if you want more, you can go to www.exploreasian.org. Um, so that's um, great, actually. You know, they're doing fantastic things right now virtually. Uh, so, so I wanted to, you know, to encourage everyone to, to check their uh, site out. Um, as well, just a, a kind last comment. Uh, you know, I really appreciate all, all of you uh, joining today, uh, you know, our advisory group, uh, you know, including me, Connie, um, you know, Alice and Adrian and, and all the different um, members that we have and, and Beck and, you know, we, we, we've put this on 11 weeks now. And so we're, um, we're getting better at a lot of these different things, but we're, we're hopefully next week, we're just going to do a regular social instead of bringing on speakers. Because as I mentioned to some of you, you know, there's a lot of anxiety sometimes that, you know, we need to get the speakers who want to get the topics. So, um, <laughs> and you know, like today, right, we're, we're a little bit over, but I think, uh, you know, that's okay. So, um, I think that's, that's really, you know, we, we kind of hope to keep engaging everyone. And so, you know, thanks again, Barbara, Ben, Alice, uh, you know, Dr. Yu and, and, uh, you know, Minister Kang, I think um, it's fantastic for um, you guys to share your perspectives. And I don't think it's going to, I don't think it's the end of this conversation. So, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe there's another conversation to be had a bigger conversation. So, um, you know, thank you. And um, yeah, I think uh, that's Connie. Did you have anything to add? 
No, I just want to say I'm so inspired by all of you and thank you for all of your advice that you provided and it's bigger than us. And I think in the beginning of the conversation before we started with all the participants, um, Barbara, you've mentioned a lot of different hashtags along with Ben as well. So I think we should continue to use those to just really emphasize that we're all doing this together. We're all in this together. So thank you very much again for all of your time, um, very generous time um, to share your thoughts and perspective and how we can really continue to lead um, and take our steps forward. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks so much for having. Yes, thank you. Okay, thanks, everyone. Great, thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.